Our next speaker uh, is uh, Hugo Cui from ENS Paris. Um, and he's going to talk about uh, large deviations for the perceptron model and the consequences for active learning. So hi, everyone. I'm Hugo, and I'm going to present joint work with Lucas Salieti, working at TNS currently, and Lenka Zdebrova. So basically, it's a physicist, a theorist contribution to the problem of pool-based active learning. So a quick recap for those of you who may be unfamiliar with that very nice and interesting problem. So imagine you have a huge data set which you want to use to train a neural network. And the problem is you can't use it whole. You have to select a fraction of it and only train your neural network on that fraction. Such limitation can be encountered in practice in a variety of settings. One of which is uh, the one is this 2019 paper by Zhang and collaborators, by the way, you recognize some board members of uh, this MS mail conference in the list of authors. So basically what they're trying to do is to use a neural network to predict some characteristic energy in uh, alloys. And basically uh, there's a huge number of existing alloys, of course, but you can't get easily the label for one data point. You have to run a costly ab initial calculation, which you can't do for all possible existing alloys. So you have to select some data points beforehand and generate the label only for those selected uh, selected data points and then hands those data points to the neural network for training. So an algorithm that will tell you a, a, a smart way of selecting those data points is called an active learning algorithm. And since you have in this particular case an existing pool of data to choose from, it's called pool-based active learning. So of course, if you're not using the whole data set, you are losing some information. And the question, of course, is just how much information are you losing? So we wanted to quantify things, but as usual, there's a trade-off. You want to be quantitative. You have to, to treat a rather unrealistic model. So, so we studied the um, teacher-student perception model, which is a widely studied and very interesting model for inference. So basically, our data set is a Gaussian. It has, um, it's a Gaussian matrix. It's unstructured. And you generate the labels using a reference single layer um, neural network perception with weight vector x0. And it, then you try to fit a student perception with the same architecture. So everything I'll be telling you is up to this point is um, showing the limit where at p, the number of samples goes to infinity while being proportional to the input dimension n. And so the goal of the study is basically twofold if you want. The first one is to quantify just how much information can you preserve by only using a fraction small n of your data set. And then once you have that information theoretic higher bound, if you want, from, uh, for the information you can preserve, how do you actually design, can you actually design an algorithm that will approach this optimal amount of information? And so before we start, maybe you've been wondering what I mean exactly by information. I actually mean the mutual information between the label and the teacher weight x0. So basically you want to choose the subset S star that maximizes the amount of information encoded about X zero in the label for this particular subset. So that if I give you this um, label plus or minus one for all the vectors in that subset, you have uh, the maximally good idea about what the X zero I actually used to generate those labels. So it's a rather intuitive measure of informativeness for any subset. I, I'd say it's uh, the natural one. And it's all the more natural if you are versed into physics, for example. So you may play around with this uh, expression for the mutual information and recognize what we call the entropy or the garden volume or the version space. So it goes by many names, but just quantifies basically the amount of uncertainty the student has about what the true ground truth vector x0 is. And so the less uncertain it is, the better is generalization ability and so on. So the goal, uh, what the quantity we actually computed is what we call the complexity. So the complexity sigma n v is the algorithm of the number of ways to select the function n so that at the end of the day, you have a garden of volume v. So in practice, how do we do this? I, I'll just be very brief. Uh, we set up a large deviations computation. Physicists just call it um, a grand canonical partition function computation. And you do this using um, the replica trick from statistical physics under its replica symmetric form. 
I'm moving on to the results. So basically, you recognize on the left axis uh, the complexity, which we're just in. The brief reminder piece, number of samples, and the input dimension, a small n is the number of samples you can afford to use divided by the input dimension. Um, basically, for example, n equals 0.3, so the left, uh, the rightmost curve, the red one on that plot, corresponds to your taking 10% of your data set. So, as you can see, there's lots of ways to select those 10% among the available pool of available data points so that if you train your neural network on those 10%, you end up with a garden volume of 0.8. If you ask for smaller garden volume, that is more mutual information, that is better generalization ability for the student, you have to choose those 10% in a smart way, and there are less ways to do so. And that's why the complexity curve decreases as you go to small, towards smaller uh, Gardner volume V values, et cetera. And up to 0 0.6, you can see that there's only one single way of selecting your 10% so that you end up with a Gardner volume of 0 0.6. In other words, that the minimal Gardner volume you can possibly have by only using 10%. And so um, you have to select those 10% in the smartest way to get 0 0.6. So you can repeat that for different fraction of uh, the data set you use. And what you get is a lower bound for the garden volume, or equivalently a higher bound for the um, mutual information that you can preserve by only using a fraction of the data set. So this gives, as I said, a, a, an absolute bound and whatever the knowledge your active learning algorithm can access. So, you know, for this selection, the, the algorithm used for your selection can leverage on different knowledges. For example, some may only use the knowledge of the samples, which you can, it sees as high dimensional vectors. Some may have additional knowledge about the data structure, which can use to well, select the samples in a smarter way. Basically, in our simple setting, you can distinguish between two kinds of algorithm, agnostic strategies who only know the samples themselves, and there have been very interesting work being done on that particular setting in 92 by Sangopper and Sopolinsky in the particular case where the um, number of, um, of sample diverges faster than the dimension. And non label agnostic strategies who, in addition to the knowledge of the data points, also have knowledge of the true labels and uh, can use that knowledge to, to select them in a smarter way. So this is not completely cheating uh, because if you think about, for example, NLP classification task, you can run a, a, a step of a keyword analysis, a quick step of keyword analysis to get an idea of what the true label is and you can then leverage on that knowledge to get a smarter selection. So this slide is just to say that there's several level of um, informed or more or less informed strategies and that are bound holds for any of them. So this discussion so far has been really largely information theoretic. And you may wonder, can I design an algorithm that will do uh, rather well? So there are two plots. The first one is for the Gardner volume. The second one is the generalization error. By the way, the fact that the two look uh, pretty much the same just shows how the Gardner volume is a good proxy for the generalization error. So the purple solid line is uh, are bound for the Gardner volume. While the dashed curve is the Sopolinsky lower bound for agnostic strategies. And the yellow and blue dots are just algorithm that we propose for illustrative purposes that are inspired by approximate message passing uh, procedures. And they do quite well. So this is just to show how those error bounds are not too far away from being realistic. They can be approached by real world algorithms. And last slide. I'll address maybe the question some of you may have, what to use for deriving those bounds. So again, there's two plots. First one is for B, the second one for the epsilon G, the generalization error. Well, uh, we think that the one of the use may be to benchmark existing strategies. So in our case, we took the uh, famous query by community strategy and some uh, uncertainty sampling using a logistic regression or perception learning rule. And we just plotted their performance against our error bounds, just to see how close they were from being optimal. 
And so, well, here the dashed line again is low bound proposed by Sopolinsky and um, collaborators for agnostic strategies. And so, for example, this allows us to say, for example, this perception strategy, authority sampling strategy is quite bad at the beginning. It's quite close to the random learning curve. It's not performing quite well, but at the end, it's close to optimality. So, well, this error bounds can be can be used to say just how far you're from being optimal actually as a, an active learning strategy. So there's some quick words about possible outlooks. As you may have realized, everything I've presented is specific. It depends highly on the data structure at hand and the architecture of the neural network you're actually using. So it'd be interesting if, um, well, just to see if the, the, the benchmarking for this particular teacher-student perception model just generalizes or not for other structures of data or architectures. And basically, I've presented also the, I've, I've mentioned those active, uh, those, sorry, approximate message passing procedures which are working quite well in this case of structured data. And maybe one of the most interesting challenges and follow up for this work would be to generalize those algorithms so that they work on uh, real structured data. And uh, well, I thank you for your attention. All right, thank you. Um, I think we have uh, with time to take a couple of quick questions. Uh, we have one here. Uh, what is the underlying assumption of the replica uh, symmetry calculations. All right, okay. Um, so basically replica symmetry is the following one. So instead of computing the, um, the expectation of a logarithm, you're actually computing the expectation of a limit. You know, you write the logarithm as a limit when s tends to zero of uh, the quantity at hand, or s minus one, and you divide everything by s. And so uh, basically, so you, you, you move from a system with a certain number of degrees of freedom to a certain number of, uh, with a certain system with S times this, this number of degrees of freedom. So you're actually replicating your system S times with S being a non-integer. And then you, you hope that everything goes well and just uh, um, carry on with the, the the computation and at a certain point you have to make an ansatz and that's why it's called a replica symmetric assumption. So I invite you to, to check this um, reference I put on the, um, on the bottom of that particular slide which explain it in the great details but basically uh, the replica trick is an exact computation but really not rigorous. So uh, I think it, it's, it'll be clearer if just um, I thought I'd just refer you to this particular reference here. Okay. All right. So, uh, all right. um, another question is: uh, Can the theory be used in a sequential way to guide the choice of next data point slash uh, experiment? Yes. Uh, yes and no, actually. So, this theory just gives you what's the best you can expect to do. It's um, so as for heuristics, actually, okay. So you can get those curves also by what's called an approximate message passing algorithm, and but that will only tell you uh, what the best you can do. Basically, it will give you the same thing. You can't use it for heuristic. That's why we haven't included it in the paper. And we used also approximate message passing procedures, but those one were, were more heuristic in nature. So. Yes, as I said in the outlook, one of the challenges to generalize the AMP we use to actually derive the optimal point into an active learning strategy that will actually tell you which data point you have to select, but that we haven't done already. It's uh, left for future work. I hope okay. it's clear. Yeah. All right, thank you.